Thanks for joining us today online at the Met. Here at the Met, we're all about connecting people to God and one another. If you have any questions or want to get more information about what's going on here at the Met, then head to our website at metchurch.com. We love to stay connected with you throughout the week through social media, so be sure to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Today, our senior pastor, Bill Ramsey, will be giving a message on our series, Expand.
from the heights I will bring a sacrifice with these hands lifted high hear my song hear my cry I will bring a sacrifice I will bring a sacrifice great seeing everybody here on a Sunday morning. Why don't you go ahead and put a big smile on your face, greet the people around you, shake their hand, introduce yourself, then you keep on worshiping with us.
faithful God who will see us through all of our circumstances, all of our difficulties, all of our obstacles. He is always there. But we also have a God who pursues us when we've run away, when we've gotten kind of lost out there. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, there's nothing that can separate us from God's love. So what you need to realize is that you have a God that is pulling you closer to him every day, no matter where you're going. So no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're dealing with, realize you have a God who loves you. He's faithful to see you through all things, and he's bringing you back to him. That's what this next song is all about. God's pursuing us. Let's worship him.
the power of your blood. You have won my innocence in the power of the cross. You've forgotten all my sin. Now on my heart this word is written, forgiven, forgiven. On my heart this word is written, forgiven, forgiven. No guilt or shame can hold me. I'm covered by your mercy. On my heart this word is written, forgiven, forgiven. Yes, this is your final word for us. Now on my heart this word is written, forgiven, forgiven. On my heart this word is written, forgiven, forgiven. No guilt or shame can hold me. I'm covered by your mercy on my heart. This word is written, forgiven, forgiven. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the fact that you do forgive us. You don't look at our past. You don't look at our shame. You don't look at our mess-ups. You look at your son who loved us so much that he came and 
gave his life for all of us. He died for us. He was buried for us. And on the third day, he rose again for us. And now we have life in him. And God, we just want to live out that life that Jesus died for us. We want to live lives that glorify you. God, we want to put past our past. And we want to go towards you. We want to follow your ways. We want to trust you in all things. And that's why this morning we're asking you to open our hearts and minds to the words that you've given to Bill. Because these are words that give us direction. These are words that give us the courage to, to keep going when we keep being pulled in all the wrong directions. These are words that give us strength. God, help us to not just hear these words this morning, but apply them to our lives so that we're better prepared when we leave this place to walk in your ways. Change us, God. Change us this morning to be all that you've called us to be. And God, now that as we continue to worship you through the giving of our tithes and offerings, God, we just pray that you see our hearts, you see that we're joyful givers, and we give back in love and obedience to you. And God, we ask that your hand is on this offering, that you would bless it for us as a church so we can continue to do more and more ministry, bringing more and more people into your kingdom because that's what it's all about, God. It's all about you. It's all about Jesus. We love you and we praise you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Right now, our ushers are getting ready to come forward to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. But first, we want you to take a look at what's happening here at the Met. Hi, my name is Amber, and this is your Met 5. Here at the Met, we want to help all of our guests become family. Are you ready to take the next step in your faith journey? Or maybe you want to be baptized and have a few questions. Well, join us at our next faith and baptism class held on May 6th during the 11 o'clock service in Classroom C. This is the perfect opportunity for you to meet some of our staff and let us help you grow in your faith. You can register online or at the Community Life Counter in the lobby. The week of June 11th through 15th, your current K through fourth grader will have the opportunity to be a part of one of the best weeks of the year in Met Kids. At Wow Week, your child will interact with God and one another in a variety of fun and focused activities. Visit the booth out in the lobby if your child has previously registered or you register them online because they are now eligible to spin the prize wheel to win some really cool things. On May 18th and 19th, join us at the Met for the Pink Impact Simulcast. This is where you'll discover relevant content designed to challenge every mother, daughter, grandmother, sister, and friend to pursue the dreams God's placed in her heart. You'll experience powerful worship and inspiring messages from speakers like Priscilla Shire, Christine Kane, Lisa Harper, and others. You'll leave knowing that you were poised by God to make an impact in your world. Registration is available online or at the Community Life Counter. In May of 2019, experience a trip of a lifetime. We'll be traveling to the Holy Land to walk where Jesus walked. This is a 10-day study tour led by Al and Elaine Burton, and you'll be able to encounter God's Word like never before as the scriptures come alive before your eyes. For more information, visit metchurch.com Israel. The Run for Kids race is coming up on May 5th, and registration is still open. The 1K and 5K race are family and dog friendly. You'll have a great opportunity for our church family to help raise money for God Care School and Orphanage. Please come by and support our race by volunteering, running, or bidding in the silent auction. All of the profits from the race will go straight to Uganda and continue the mission work that the Met has been accomplishing over there for the last seven years. For all the details and information or to register for any of our events, you can always visit our website at metchurch.com or visit the Community Life Counter in the lobby. Thanks again for watching. I'm Amber, and this was your Met 5. I came up out of the water, raised my hands up to the Father. Gave it all to him that day Felt a new and kissed my face Walked away Eyes wide open Finally see Where I was going It didn't matter where I'd been 
I'm not the same man I was then Got on track, I made mistakes Back slipped my way into that place Where souls get lost, lines get crossed And the pain Everything about our world is changing. We're in constant flux. Everything is changing. It just seems like uh, the world that we grew up in is different than the world we're living in. And uh, Mark Twain once said that the only people that likes change are wet babies. <laughs> so some extent or another, we resist change. We don't really like it. But change, as we all know, is inevitable. It's inescapable. Uh, there are people who, who change their hairstyles. They change their clothes. They change their weight. They change their jobs, they change towns, they change houses, they change spouses. And so many times th people are thinking that in changing all of those things, it ultimately will change them. But what I want to talk to you about is this reality that uh, no matter where you go, there you are. <laughs> you cannot run from you. And I want to talk to you about the most significant thing in your life that has to change, and when it changes, everything else will change and it is your mind, <laughs> your mind. I want to challenge you this morning, the idea of expanding your mind. 
to break out of some habits and some patterns. Have you ever seen anybody that just, just continues to, to, to repeat the same pattern over and over again? Just get stuck on stupid. <laughs> just stuck on stupid. And all of a sudden you have dumb and dumb produces dumb junior and dumb junior comes along and produces dumb the third and then you have coming behind that is dumb to dumb dumb. <laughs> and you just wonder how in the world can you break out of that pattern? Well, I want to tell you it's not your town, it's not your house, it's not your spouse, it's not your job, it's not your clothes, it's not your weight, it's not your hair, it's none of that. It is your mind. And until you change your mind, nothing else in your life will continually, consistently change. Nothing will change. Uh, I, I love the late, great Zig Ziglar. And he used to talk about getting the check up from the neck up. And he said, most people need to get rid of stinking thinking. And he's right on the mark. In fact, there's a proverb that says, as a person thinks in their heart, so will they be. Think about that verse. But basically what it's saying is you and I, we, you're, you're not what you think you are, but what you think you are. So what do you think about that? What do you think about you? What do you think about where you are? What do you think about where you're going? Have you ever stopped to think about, maybe I just need to change my mind. Maybe my thinking hasn't been right. I found that it's not the things that happen to you that are as significant as how you think about the things that happen to you. What do you let your mind dwell on? What do you allow your mind to think about? It is so important because you and I will ultimately, as we'll see in a moment, go in the direction of your thoughts, in the direction of your, of your mind. Now, let me give you a verse this morning. There's many that talk about the significance of our thinking and the significance of our mind. But let me go to the book of Romans this morning. And in Romans chapter 12, there's a verse I want to call to your attention. I want to kind of break it apart and for us to think about it. It's in verse 2, of Romans 12. The Bible here says, Paul writing, saying, do not conform. Now, note the word conform. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Now, understand that expression, conforming to the pattern of this world. Now, what is, what is the pattern of this world? When I grew up, my dad was a pastor, and I grew up hearing a lot about worldliness. That was an expression that was used when I was a kid, worldliness. And there was a lot of teaching on what worldliness was. For example, 1 uh, uh, John 2.15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loved the world, the love of the Father is not in them. And I was taught sometimes that means staying away from certain people, separating yourself from them, certain behaviors and certain patterns and habits, and that's what it means to be separate from the world. But to understand really what worldliness is, you need to understand what the Greek words really mean when they use the word world, because there's several. Uh, for example, there's one usage of the word world that has to do with times. Uh, times, God created the worlds, eons of time. There's another word that is used to describe world. It has to deal with people. Uh, John 3, 16, for God created, uh, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So sometimes it talks about times. Sometimes it talks about people. Sometimes it talks about created things, rocks and trees and mountains and rivers and oceans. And so sometimes the word world means that. But in this occasion, this is not talking about that. This idea of the pattern of the world is the idea of cosmos, cosmos. Uh, we get the idea of a system from that world. Like ladies put on cosmetics. It comes from the idea of a system. There's a systematic order that all that happens. We men don't understand, but we appreciate it. And we understand that there's a system that is associated with cosmetics. Therefore, the, it comes from the idea of cosmos, a system, an orderly system of doing things. So when Paul here is saying, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, he's not talking about times, he's not talking about created things, he's not talking about people, he's here talking about a system. Now, in our modern-day vernacular, as I communicate to you, I wouldn't necessarily use the word or the term worldliness because I'm not sure everybody would get that. Some people hear that, and it's kind of Christianese. They don't know what that word really means. So I would use this word. It's a better word that fits in our modern society. I would use this word secularism. We all get that word, right? Secularism. We are in a world where there is a system of secularism. In a spiritual context, worldliness. The system could be defined as being a system that does not include God in its thinking. It, just, it does not include God. It does not incorporate God in its reasoning. 
It is a world that exists. It is a system that is there that does not engage God at any point. In fact, many people that are in the system that have been conformed to the system, some become what I would call theoretic atheist, where they have come to the conclusion in their mind that there is no God. He cannot be proven by science, and therefore, because I cannot prove this by science, I have arrived at the position that I am now a theoretic atheist. Well, that's not where most people are. It's where some people are. Most people here who are being conformed into the system are what I would call practical atheists. They just live as though there's no God. They just live like God doesn't exist. In fact, it's the idea of uh, Psalm 53. I love how it's translated in the King James Version. The Bible says in the King James Version, the foolish person has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, uh, what I like about the King James translation, it's probably the most honest of all those translations because when the translators would insert a word for the purpose of clarity, and when you read it in the King James, it is always in italics. So you always know here is a word that was not in the original that was an in, inserted by the uh, translators for clarity. So when you read this verse that I've just given you in the King James uh, translation, the words there is are in italics, meaning uh, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Those words are in italics. I mean, you could drop those words and it not affect the meaning. The fool has said in his heart, no God. A practical atheist. In other words, no God for me. I'm okay if you want to have a God. I'm okay if you want to worship God. But for me, uh, th th there's no God for me. That's where a lot of people are. That's the default setting. That's what we came into this world with. It's the natural settings that most people have in their life. It's just this idea that I don't see a point in God. I don't see a need for God. And the only time most of the times when people like that connect with God or reach out to God is when they don't have another choice. When the doctor says, I've done all I can do, you need to pray. They go, oh my God, are we down to that? <laughs> I mean, when all else fails, pray. I mean, he's my, he's my you know, uh, the, the life raft. He's the parachute. He's the last resort. And so there are people who would not say I am a theoretic atheist. They may say I'm more of a, a practical atheist. I just live his life as though I don't see the need for a God in my life. And Paul is saying there is a tendency, if you're not careful, to be conformed. Conformed, pressed into the mold of. To allow your thinking to be driven by this pattern of the world. We're in a very secular society. And if you aren't careful, even if someone is connected to Christ, there is a tendency we have to be pressed back into that mold where we really don't pray. We don't think about God. We think about him when we're in a, tr we're in a mess or we're in trouble and we really need. But on the day, by day, by day, by day, by day, by day we don't think about him. <laughs> we, it just doesn't cross our mind. And so when that happens, you are basically doing what Paul said. You're being conformed to the pattern, the system of the world. But instead, notice what he said, but this is in contradistinction to what he's just said. Don't be conformed, but note this word, be transformed. And you will be one or the other. You will either be conformed or you will be transformed. Now, that word transform is interesting in the Greek language. It's metamorphosis. Um, you remember in school when you would study about the little caterpillar that would go into the cocoon uh, and, and emerge as the butterfly? I heard about two little caterpillars and they were crawling down the road. One little caterpillar looked at the other one and said, look at that butterfly. Wow, isn't that amazing, a butterfly fluttering over their head? And the little caterpillar looked back at him and said, man, you'll never get me up in one of those things. It's pretty funny when you think about it. But we all know that that caterpillar goes into the cocoon. <laughs> that was really corny. And what, <laughs> what happens is there is a process called metamorphosis, right? It's where that caterpillar goes through a process where it now emerges as a, I don't know why I did that, where it emerges as a <laughs> butterfly. I guess that's my butterfly sign. So, so it's where, uh, let me give it to you another way. It's where the inner nature of something goes outward. It's what's inside you now is seen outside of you, Right? Well, Paul is saying there's a process that you go through where when you are connected to your creator and you have the spirit of God living within you, there is a, a tr it's a process, by the way, a process you go through through experiences in life, a process you go through through the disciplines of life where the, the, the inner nature, the spirit of God living within you suddenly is obvious outside of you. So he's saying you will either do that or you will do the other. You will either be conformed into the secular pattern of the world, into the system that doesn't include God, or you will be transformed, metamorphosized, so that what is in you comes out of you and other people can see God living in and through your life. 
And note here he says, this happens, note the word by, by. How does this happen? By the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. This happens, this process of resisting being conformed and embracing being transformed happens in how I think by the renewing of my mind. In fact, when the Bible talks about us connecting with God, it uses this term about giving him our heart, our heart. Now, it's obviously not talking about the muscle pumping blood through our body. It's talking about something other than that. And I've been able to discover there are at least three different things in Scripture that really constitute what your heart is. When the Bible says, give, God says, give me your heart. Uh, when you give your heart to someone else, you have somebody you love, you say, I've given you my heart. Well, what does that mean? Well, in summary, it means I have given you all, uh, let me say, I, I love you with all that I am. I love all that you are with all that I am, right? I've given you my heart. Um, if you break that apart, I think there are probably three things that constitute the heart. Uh, one is emotion, emotion. When you love someone or you love something, there's emotion attached to that. That's true with God. It's true with decisions you make. There are emotional. Now, the only thing I would tell you to tap the brake a little bit on emotions is it's probably the shallowest part of who you are, your emotions. So if you're a person that just reacts and responds emotionally to every situation, you're probably going to overreact in some cases and you're going to, you know, just flatline in other cases. You have to be careful that you don't base everything you do and think and believe based on just emotion alone. Emotions are shallow. They're fickle. How many emotions have you experienced since you woke up this morning? <laughs> you jump up, good morning, Lord. Some of you got up and said, good Lord, it's morning, right? <laughs> Both of them are emotional responses. So I'm suggesting to you that you, you can be happy one minute, sad the next, good one minute, not so good the next minute. It all depends on what traces through your brain. So your emotions are real fickle. They just all over the page. But it's a part of who you are. It's part of your heart. So emotion, that's part of the heart. Another the part of the heart is uh, uh, your will. Um, volition, your will, what you do. If you love someone, you respond to them. If you love something, you respond to it. There, there's a part of my will that is a part of my heart, at my core, is who I am. And so when you love or like, or you even despise or hate, all of that affects your will. So when I give Jesus my heart, it is a, an emotional decision, it is a, a willful decision. He said it's a gift, you receive the gift. I have to exercise my, I have to receive this gift. So the will. Here's the third part, and this is what I'm talking about this morning. It's also your mind. Your mind, it's intellectual. Uh, Isaiah says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. So it's reasonable. You don't check your brain in the car and let someone in a big box like this think for you. You, you, you engage intellectually. You think through this. Uh, Christianity is a reasonable thing. A relationship with God is a, a re it, it, you can reason through it. You can think about it. And so here in this narrative, Paul is saying that part of your heart that constitutes reason, that part of your heart that constitutes intellect. He's simply saying the way to get unstuck from stupid and the way to stop the progression of doing crazy, dumb things is you have to have a transformation in your life. And this happens in how you think about things. You've got to break some of these negative patterns of thought that are causing some terrible decisions that are leading to some bad consequences. It all starts with my thoughts. Usually when somebody does something incredibly stupid in life, it's because they've rehearsed it a lot of times in their head. Very few people that I've talked about in my ministry career have gone out and done anything splendidly stupid that they hadn't for a long period of time thought about it, considered it, acted out scenarios, fantasized, considered the possibilities of, and acted all that out in their head. So once all of that is staged and you're ready and you're prepared and you're rehearsed and you know your lines, <laughs> then life gives you opportunity. And you step up and go, I was born for this. And you may not be. You may have done something stupid. You may have been considering something for a long time that's now going to affect and harm your life. And it all happened in your, happened in your head. We have a lot of counselors in our church and psychologists in our church, and most of them will tell you that when you get someone to talk about what they think about, many times they won't believe what they've heard themselves say. 
Your mind can be a very powerful thing. A mind unchanged, listen, a mind unchanged can be a destructive thing. You know why? What is one of the punishments they do for really bad criminals in prison when they act out against other inmates? They put them in a place called what kind of confinement? Solitary confinement. You know what happens when you're there? You're left alone with you. <laughs> you're just alone with your thoughts. Heard about a guy who was in this, this psychiatric ward and he had his ear to the wall and every time the nurse would walk by, she'd look at him, he had his ear to the wall. And she said, are you okay? He went, shh, shh, shh. She said, what? He went, shh, be quiet. She said, what? He goes, she said, I don't hear anything. He said, me either, and it's been like that all day. <laughs> The, I'm sorry. The worst thing in the world you can do sometimes is be left alone with your thoughts. Your thoughts, because our thoughts unchanged are, are destructive. Our thoughts unchanged can impact us, and, and, and not always for the good. So I want to get to the heart of what I want to talk to you about. It. And the first thing I want to tell you is you and I need a changed default. A changed default. Our default settings are secular, our default settings are natural. My default setting is a mind alienated from God. That's my default setting. I came into the world with that setting. I, I'm good at thinking bad thoughts. I'm good at rehearsing things that I shouldn't be thinking about. I'm Because that's my default setting. That's your default setting. We, we all came equipped with that ability. That's why it's easier to go negative than to go positive. That's why it's easier to think the worst of someone than the best in someone, because it's, it's just the way we're wired. It is a default setting. When Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, he, he refers to it as being a natural position. The natural person, the person default mode, separated from God, the person doesn't have spiritual uh, sensitivity. It's like I could tell you this morning, right here on this stage, right now, there, there's ball games that are being acted out. There's a movie that's happening up here. I could tell you about all these things that are going on this stage, and you would look at me like maybe I've been listening to the wall and not hearing anything. But the reality is if we had the ability to receive and interpret the signals through something called a television or a radio, you know what you would discover? You would discover all through the air are signals that once interpreted, are, we're allowed to see things that we can't see otherwise. That those things are actually real and those things are actually happening and those things are actually going on. So when a person in their natural setting says, I don't understand you uh, 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 comprehending spiritual things, they really don't understand that. That's why somebody may say, well, if you talk to God, that's a, a mental illness, right? Or if God talks to you, I think it was uh, the way that it was phrased. Because they're in a natural default state, they're not in a spiritual state of connected to God. So they really, they really seriously don't understand that how you could sense the working of God in your life, how you could sense the leadership of God. They, they really don't get it. And, and by the way, arguing with somebody like that doesn't do any good. Somebody says, when you, when you argue with somebody like that, you say like two crazy people arguing. So it is sudden, it, it's, it's something that you can't necessarily express. It's something they're going to have to eventually experience. And until they experience, they won't understand you. So don't argue with them. Don't argue with them. I'm just suggesting to you that before you can really change your thinking, you have to change your default settings. It's an interesting term, the term change, because it's the same way in which we define the word repent. Metanoia. Metanoia in the Greek is to turn or to change. So when I say change the default setting, the computer came with a certain uh, set of rules and the system operates off of default settings so that if the system crashes, if something goes wrong, the computer automatically resets itself back to default settings. Again, I, I'm not real technical, uh, technical. I don't understand a lot of that. Uh, when I hit something occasionally in the office that I don't get, I don't say, hey, Siri. I say, hey, Lindsay. <laughs> I need you to come in and help a brother. <laughs> I'm out punting my coverage here. So I'm just saying I'm not real. But here's what I know about that, and that is those computers do have default settings. They come from the factory. People have that too. <laughs> we came into this world with those default settings. It's the natural setting. And so you have to change the setting, metanoia, repent, to turn, to change them. Uh, when you receive Jesus, when you connect with your creator, two things happen. You turn from sin to the Savior. You turn to the Savior from sin. But you make a connection with God, and immediately the default settings are changed. Now look, 
when the system crashes, it, it may go back to those systems. What do I mean by that? Something bad happens in your life. Um, something hits you that you don't understand, not fair. You go through a rough experience, and all of a sudden, you're going to know, I still got default settings. <laughs> something rolls out of your mouth that wasn't real sanctified. <laughs> it's a reminder, you still have default settings. You never get to a point until we step into the presence of God, you're going to have default settings. The old nature is there. But I'm saying, when you connect with the Creator, you have an ability to change those settings. Now you have a different set of, of rules in the system that can override those default settings. You, you, you don't have to be a slave to those types of settings. You have changed the default. You did it the minute you turned and received Jesus as your Savior. So I have a changed default. It's affecting my mind. Second thing, it results in a changed devotion. Man, when you change your default settings, the things you love change too. When someone with an old default setting hears a verse like, love your enemies, they go, what? Are you crazy? What are you smoking? Love my enemies? Somebody with that old default setting, they don't get that term at all. But when you've connected with your creator, all of a sudden you've experienced a power within you that gives you an, an ability to do things you thought at one time were impossible to do. I can love my enemies. I, you, you actually have a power within you to overcome the adversities. You have an ability to soar when other people sink because you've changed the default settings and it's affecting the devotion and the love of your heart. I remember the sons of, uh, of, uh, 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 of thunder, the Bible called them, uh, James and John. And their mother brought the sons of thunder to Jesus on one occasion. And she said, hey, uh, Jesus, uh, I would like for one of my sons to sit on your left hand and one on your right hand when you come into your kingdom. Isn't that sweet? That's a mama, right? I just want these to be your choice boys. I want one boy to sit here and one boy to sit there. And Jesus didn't rebuke her. He didn't even say that's not possible. What he did, basically, is he told her, those are the best seats in the house. <laughs> and it's going to cost you some money. If you sit in those seats, it's going to cost Those are box seats. That's stage right, stage left. It's going to cost you some money. Those are expensive. If your boys are going to get close to me, it's going to cost them something. There's a verse in Galatians where Paul uh, says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. The word marks in the Greek is stigmata. I bear in my body the stigmata of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you understood how warfare happened in that first century, you would know that kings always went into battle with their soldiers. And more often than not, the king would be in the forefront of the battle, pressing the battle because the, the soldiers would see how heroic and brave and courageous the king is, and it would inspire them to be willing to sacrifice. And so the king would press the battle. And all, listen, all the arrows of the enemy were trained at the king. The best archers, the snipers, everyone was trying to, because if you could take out the king, you could demoralize the troops, you could turn the battle in your favor, and you might win. So since everyone knew that's a tactic of warfare, that the first person they're going to shoot at is going to be the king, if you were a soldier and you're fighting close to the king, you either need to really love your king or you need to be really sold on the cause because you're probably going to get shot at. They're not shooting at you, they're shooting at him. You just have to be close to him. So when you press into the king, you, so after the battle was won, they would have this triumphant inter, uh, 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 procession back into the city celebrating, and people would cheer and shout. And here would be these soldiers, and they would bear in their body the stigmata, the marks, the scars of the battle. And when the people saw that, they knew this guy got his wounds because he was fighting close to the king. He's no coward. This guy got his wounds because he was pressing into the king close to the battle. And Paul said, that's my relationship with God. I bear in my body stigmata, marks, because I have fought closest to the king. And what Jesus was saying, they're fine to come close to me. I don't care if one's on the right and one's on the left, but they're going to get shot at, and you need to be okay with that, Mom. And the Bible says that they were called the sons of thunder. They had anger issues, a little road rage going on back then. But what's interesting about it, when you study James and John throughout the New Testament, you know what happens? Something transforms them. The defaults change and the devotion changes. John wrote more about love than any other of the apostles, any of them. He wrote more about love. He started out as a son of thunder and he became apostle of love. What happened? Transformation. 
He wasn't conformed into a system of the world. He was transformed. And I contend what's obvious was something in his thinking changed. It was the renewing of his mind. When the defaults were, were changed, suddenly the devotion has changed, and John became a new man. And here ultimately is what it will lead you to. This is the third one, and we're done. It will bring about a changed destiny. A changed destiny. I said earlier, you'll go in the direction of your thoughts. You, you will. You're here this morning because you thought yourself here first. At some point, <laughs> you said, I'm going to go to church today. Maybe it was this morning, nothing's on TV, I don't know, I don't know, what else are we going to do? I mean, I hope, you're, I hope it was bigger than that or deeper than that, but uh, I'm just glad you're here. Or maybe you said all week long, going to church, going to hit that 11 o'clock, you know? I don't know, but I'm saying at some point you decided to be here, you wouldn't be here. In a little while we'll break out of this holy huddle and some of you are going to go, I'm going to go to Babe's. Brother's going to get some chicken and some mashed potatoes and some, and some corn, you know, mm, I don't know, my mind always goes there when I get hungry. I don't know why. <laughs> Sorry, Titus. I'm not going to babes, by the way, dude, just so you know. It's not going to happen. But I'm just suggesting to you that, that, that's, that if, if you go there, if you go there, it's because your head was there first. You, you go in the direction of your thoughts. That's why be careful what you think about, because you're going to ultimately end up where you are thinking. Sometimes you've got to surround yourself with different people. People can influence how you think. You know that? I found that there's, there's at least two classes of people that you'll encounter in life. There are those who you will minister to and those who will minister to you. And sometimes it's reciprocal. Sometimes you minister to and they minister right back to you. Sometimes it goes one way. And sometimes it just comes back to you one way. So that's all about you, you, But you have to define the relationship. And you have to watch the gauges. You have to be careful because if you get yourself in a situation where all you're doing is giving out and you're not taking in, it won't be long until you're not going to hold up like that. Listen, you are a limited resource. You are a limited resource. You can't be all things to all people. You can't be a people pleaser. Or you'll get home at, uh, at the end of your day worn out, exhausted, with everybody you encountered happy except you. So I'm just suggesting to you this morning that you have to be careful who, who you surround yourself. You need people in your life who replenish you because they will offset the people in your life who drain you. <laughs> and you're going to have people in your life who pour into you, and you're going to have people in your life who suck the life right out of you. <laughs> I'm just laying it out there. And I'm just suggesting to you that if you don't watch the gauges, guys, you will eventually, you'll be running on empty, and you won't be good for you or anybody else. So I'm saying part of this thinking and part of this idea of changing defaults, devotion, and, 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 and um, destiny involves who I surround myself with. And be sure I'm surrounding myself with people who are pouring into me and replenishing me and, and are healthy and are good for me to offset the people who are draining me and pulling at me. So you, you've got, I guess I'm getting it, you have to be balanced in life, balanced in your thinking because you will ultimately go in the direction of your thoughts. So this morning, I hope if you struggled a little bit with trying to change things, and you've tried to look at different ways in which you could change your life, I hope you'll give some thought, some thought to changing your thoughts. Ask you, are you connected to the Creator? Are you relying on the new system or the old system? Are you responding in the power of His Spirit at work in you? Are you relying on the old defaults? Because it'll affect devotion, it'll affect the entire direction of your life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word that always challenges us. And when we apply it, it has the power to change us. And I pray this morning for my friends who are struggling a little bit with areas of their life that they, they've tried to change and haven't seen good success. I pray this morning they could wrap their minds around the fact that the thing that needs to change first is their mind. They're thinking about it. How they think about everything. How they look at everything. Father, help us to realize that once we have changed the defaults and we've connected with the Creator, we have the power within us to truly change our thoughts. You said in Philippians 4, if there's virtue, if there's praise, if there's anything good, we can think on those things. So, Lord, help us to think good thoughts, to think right thoughts, to think your thoughts. Help us to know also that it's a battle that we don't just win at one point and we'll never fight it again. It's a battle that's fought every day and sometimes every moment of every day. So help us not to be weary doing well. 
And then I pray for my friends this morning who may never have trusted you as their Savior. I, I pray this would be the moment when they swallow their pride, they humble their heart, and they say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I believe you died on the cross, and I believe you rose on Easter, and with all that is in me now, I trust you as my Savior. And finally, for those who just need someone to pray for them and encourage them before they go, I pray as soon as I dismiss, they'll make their way here to the front and let someone spend just a few moments with them to pray for them and encourage them before they go home. Thank you, Father, for the joy of knowing Jesus and for the joy it is to make you known. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. We'll see you next weekend. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching online with us. If you have any questions or prayer requests, please contact us so that we can follow up with you this week by visiting metchurch.com. We look forward to seeing you again next week.